Good evening again. We are convening tonight to learn more about the aerial archaeology and remote sensing in the Middle East in a historical context. Our lecturer tonight will shed lights on the current importance of using remote sensing for the discovery and monitoring the condition of archaeological sites under threat across the Middle East. A major driver for such lectures and discussions is the rapid pace of change and degeneration of our cultural heritage. Our guest will discuss the main agents of damage and destruction. Furthermore, it will look forward to possible solutions, mitigation measures, and opportunities for raising awareness and increasing the understanding of the region's important archaeological sites in specific and cultural heritage in general. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Robert Bewley, who is chair of the CBRL, which stands for the Council for British Research in the Levant. Uh, and he is the co-founder and former director of the Endangered Archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa project from 2013 until 2020 at the University of Oxford. He is director of the Aerial Archaeology in Jordan project founded in, founded in 1998 and in 18 and in 2018 was able to set up the Aerial Archaeology in Oman project. Formerly director of operations at the Heritage Lottery Fund and head of survey and aerial survey at English Heritage and before that, the Royal Commission on the Historical Monuments of England. Bob has worked in Britain, Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa on aerial and field surveys, excavations, and aerial archaeology training workshops. He is an honorary visiting professor at the Institute of Archaeology, UCL, London, and a trustee for the International Association for the Study of Arabia and the Anglo-Jordanian Society. He is vice chair of the Mary Rose Trust. He received his PhD in archaeology from the University of Cambridge and was an undergraduate at, Massa, at Manchester University studying ancient history and archaeology. He is the author of six books, including Prehistoric Settlements, Aerial Archaeology, Developing Future Practice, and Ancient Jordan from the Air. As well, we are pleased to welcome our colleague, Prof. Professor Naif Haddad, our moderator tonight, who is regionally recognized for his work and research on conservation and documentation of cultural heritage sites and uh, monuments. Professor uh, Haddad is a full professor, recently was the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture and Design and the Dean of Scientific Research and Graduate Studies at American University of Madaba. In addition, recently he was served as acting president of the American University of Madaba. He is the founder and chairman of the Department of Conservation Science at Queen Ryan's Faculty of Tourism and Heritage at the Hashemite University in Jordan, where he still serves as a faculty member. He is also a founding member of Caltech for Heritage and Conservation in Jordan. This was in 2012. As a consultant and heritage expert, he was also involved in different international and local conservation and restoration projects. His publications and research are in architectural heritage and classical studies on ancient uh, science and technology, 3D digital documentation, education and multimedia, conservation and sustainable management of historical buildings, sustainable tourism, planning and development. In advance, I would uh, like to thank uh, CBRL for their efforts and contributions and the fruitful partnership with Jordan Engineer Associations Architectural Heritage Committee. So a big uh, thank you goes to Kadam Baydin and uh, Firas Baim. And of course, many thanks for the architectural division at the Jordan Engineer Associations represented by architect Ahmed Siam, who is with us tonight for the continuous support. And also uh, um, our uh, right hand and helper, uh, Ala Abu Kwek for his good and uh, powerful coordination and preparations. Last but not least, a special thank you goes to our colleague Marah Al-Khayyat, the head of the Architectural Committee for her visionary effort 
and passion. Unfortunately, Marah is not with us today, tonight, as she is traveling. I believe uh, her plane is landing now in Queen Ali Airport. Before giving the floor to Dr. Naif and uh, our uh, guest, also it's worth mentioning that uh, Jordan Engineer Associations and CBRL uh, already uh, uh, signed a uh, memorandum of understanding or collaboration about the implementation of initiatives targeting architects and students of uh, architecture to carry uh, out joint activities that contribute to spreading awareness, training, and providing a basis for discussion and research on the issue of urban heritage preservation in general and world her heritage sites in particular. Sorry for this uh, long introduction, but uh, if we uh, like to say more about our guest and about our moderator, so we'll take more than half an hour, I believe, if we gonna uh, introduce the, the full CV. Uh, we are lucky to have both of them. And uh, Dr. Naif, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Iyad, for this informative and very, uh, for me, it's very, يعني, I am proud that I, I am like this. And our uh, guest lecture, uh, Dr. Uh, Robert. And um, it is uh, my pleasure to be the moderator of this session for this important session, especially here in Jordan. We are talking about aerial archaeology and remote sensing in the Middle East. It is not only in Jordan because we have some uh, let us say uh, some cases here in Jordan, but to know about the Middle East, it is a very interesting issue to see how we can collaborate and have uh, our to understand the future of this important issue re regarding, uh, for me, monitoring and risk assessment, because aerial uh, archaeology and remote sensing as a photograph it is very easy for interpretation and the monitoring which we need is very important. What we are dealing now to make monitoring and risk assessment because we have a lot of uh, problems with our cultural heritage. So uh, not uh, to say anything, I would like again uh, to say thank you, uh, Dr. Robert for this interesting lecture and we don't want to lose time, so you can start, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very uh, much, Professor. Yes, but uh, for uh, to close, please, we have to close our mic, and the questions will be at the end of the lecture, please. Thank you all. Okay, hope, can you, thank you very much for the introductions, and um, I hope you can all see the screen. Yeah. My, my PowerPoint is sharing, that's good. Um, and. I have I've seen just how many people are in the audience and how many archaeologists are there too. Um, I've angled it though for the non-specialist, um, but obviously there will be quite a bit of archaeology. But I'm particularly interested in or glad that, that Professor Naif mentioned monitoring, because um, as you will see, we've been doing this for quite some time. I'm going to focus on aerial archaeology and and using. Um, as it were, helicopters as our vehicles. Um, I won't necessarily be mentioning drones except to the question at the end, if anybody wants to ask that. And I will mention satellites, but, but not in great detail. Um, but again, we could do that in the, in the, in the question and answers at the end. Um, so without further ado, I will kick off. Um, I'm gonna take you on a journey that as, a, as has, has already been mentioned, will cover Jordan, and then parts of Saudi Arabia and then Oman as well, and then returning to Jordan at the end. Um, I'll mention other countries as well in passing, but in, in the 50 minutes that I've got, there's so much that one could cover. These are just the four areas I'm gonna concentrate on. And a little bit of background to the journey. How did I end up uh, getting involved with um, archeology span in the Middle East? Um, uh, Ehab in his introduction mentioned that I went to Manchester University. Now Manchester was very fortunate in the 1970s in that it had a Near Eastern archaeology department run by Charles Burney and the professor of archaeology there was a Barry Jones and Barry was uh, famous for many things but two in particular his study of Roman archaeology which is why I'm a prehistorian 
And then also his study of, he used aerial archaeology. So it was one of the few universities in 1975 where you could do a course in aerial archaeology. Um, and that was very lucky for me. So I, you can see, you can see me on the end here as a very young lad in 1978, lucky enough to be able to go to Iraq with Nicholas Postgate. So that helped fuel my interest in the area as a bit of background. The other background is that there was a history of um, aerial archaeology, not so much aerial archaeology, but aerial photography taken by a number of uh, different people, both including the, the, the military and the RAF, uh, but other people as well. And uh, here's one of the pyramids, a very famous one. There's also this famous book by a Frenchman, Point de Bar, um, Antoine Point de Bar. Uh, big discussions as to whether he was an engineer. Uh, an archaeologist, a priest, or a spy. And it turns out probably he was all of those, but predominantly a spy. Now, what better cover uh, for spying over various countries than to pretend to be an archaeologist and go in helicopters? And no, I'm not a spy. Um, one of the other inspirational um, books that I came across as an undergraduate was this by Eric Schmidt, published through the Chicago Oriental Institute, uh, The Flights Over the Ancient Cities of Iran. And if you go on the Chicago Oriental Institute website, you can see all the imagery in there. They've, they've now digitized it. But also, if you get the chance to look at that book, it is one of the most spectacular books, um, I think, of archaeology, but especially aerial archaeology ever published. Um, you could give a lecture, you could do half an hour lecture just on that book alone, but I won't. Um, that's just a taster. Um, as uh, the introduction said, I was involved in aerial survey in Britain. And David Kennedy was also at Manchester just before me. And we'd met, he then went to Sheffield and I'd met him once or twice. But he happened to be working in Jordan and wanted to do aerial archaeology. He was working on the ground with, um, on his book on Rome Desert Frontier with Derek Riley. And Derek was lucky enough to go flying in Israel. Sadly, Derek's no longer with us. Uh, but he flew in Israel for three seasons in 90, 91 and 92. And I'm going through his archive um, as, as part of my activities in, in retirement. But so David emailed me in 1997 saying, I've had one flight. Um, I clearly need to learn a lot more about aerial archaeology. Rumor has it, you know a bit about aerial archaeology. Can you come and help me? And we thought it would be a relatively short project. We promised that we might write a book as well if we got permission to fly. And um, we were very, helped enormously by um, the local, um, the, or the, the, the person at the time, Time, who was the heir attaché to Jordan, Mike Sedman, and uh, not surprisingly in the background, the trailblazer was Jane Taylor, um, who helped us enormously behind the scenes to actually be able to get into the air and do this air photography. Um, so what started, or what we thought would be perhaps a short uh, project, is still ongoing as we speak. And if you could see my the, 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 the other bits of my screen, you would see that I am in the background loading images up to the Apami website as we speak from October. Um, now, more often than not, people expect that you would fly around and take pictures of the well-known sites, but actually right from the very beginning, the purpose was to expand the knowledge of archaeology and cultural heritage in Jordan to show that although there are, I mean, there is no question, Petra is one of the most spectacular places on earth, I would say. It is fantastic. Um, but there are many, 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 many other sites as well. So what I want to do is just give a little bit of a flavor of that and to show what the contribution of aerial archeology span can be. Um, from time to time, we've been asked the question, surely you can get all the information you need from satellites? And the answer is you, you might be able to get quite a lot of it from satellites, but it wouldn't be necessarily as good. And certainly from what is publicly available via Google Earth and Bing Maps and Apple Maps, the quality of the imagery is, it's, it can be good, but it's not comprehensively good. So you need a combination of all of them. And perhaps this is the moment to say that in terms of drones or aeroplanes or helicopters and then satellites, they are all complementary. And, and for me, it's not about one taking over the other as archaeologists, we use as many sources as possible. And some of you may know about LIDAR, the, um, the laser scanning from the air, equally important, but it isn't going to replace all the other things we do. And, and there is, for me, it just happens my expertise is in aerial reconnaissance for archaeology. 
And I think there's still a role for that, at least for the next 10 or 15 years. It may well be that the quality of drones remotely controlled. Um, I have this vision that when I'm 90, I can sit in an armchair and just have a drone flying over any country in the world. It may happen, it may not, but we'll see. Uh, the other question we're often asked is, surely most of the sites have already been found? And the answer to that is an emphatic no. This is a site that is only eight kilometers east of uh, Marka, this, the old civil airport in Amman. We must have flown within 100 meters of this for many, many years. And then suddenly one day, because of traffic movements and we were looking for another site, we came across this. And one person in the Department of Antiquities knew about it, but didn't have any photographs. And it's, it, it, it seems to me it's very clear what it is. It's a Roman, it's a quarry for the Roman columns uh, for Philadelphia. And you can see that here's some that have been uh, almost ready for sale. Uh, here's one that needs a bit of work on it. And here's the outline of another one that they're gonna cut out. But then as you all know, the Roman empire collapsed in the fifth century AD. And I can, it would be wonderful to do an excavation at this site because it looks like it's been relatively untouched um, ever since they left. And the workmen must have been standing there one day and said, uh, we're not getting paid, are we? We are not gonna sell these, these the, the Romans have gone, it's all over. And this site just captured it, captures that in one, in one photograph. We visited on the ground and we saw um, that there are other quarries as well. And now this area is, is really under threat because of the expansion of a man and because of the quality of the stone, the quarries and the, and the stone processing is happening literally all around this site. So it's very important that not only do we find the sites, but we communicate that with um, the local authorities, in this case, the Department of Antiquities, so that it can be protected. And that means, as already has been said, that means continuous monitoring. And, and sorry, I've just put on the bottom here, you can see that there's a, there's a website address and that's the air photography archive for all the photographs. And we've got over 120,000 photographs. Um, and it's just, it's going up as we speak, if you wish to log on and have a look at that uh, after the talk. Now it's frozen again, there we go. Um, and again, another site here, we're out in the Eastern desert in the Badia, um, a site we'd never seen before, um, probably multi-period site, as a hill fort, you can see that there's a, a wall running around the outside and then inside uh, there are these cairns. And it's very exciting when you take photographs like this because you think, well, no one has actually recorded this before, so we must be careful. But then when you zoom out from the, from the site, uh, you can see why it's also important to record it. Because as many of you will know, if not all of you will know, there is a huge amount of activity even in the most remote places with these huge great bulldozer tracks and luckily for this one the bulldozer driver decided going over the top was just too difficult he really was only going to go around and, and carry on there but look at the damage that's been done already um, and this I mean I don't know where the nearest settlement must be but it must be 50 or 60 kilometers and presumably this bulldozing is, is in advance of um, some sort of geological surveying and other things as well. Um, so we have to be continually vigilant to, to keep a record of what's going on. And satellites can do some of that, the more detailed from drones, but also being able to fly around. Um, here's, a, here's a site down in uh, Ma'an. Um, uh, this, is, this is three different sites. Uh, sorry, there are three different caravanserai here um, that all are interlinked uh, with these walls. They're probably early Islamic, and that's what it looked like in 2003. And then we went back again in 2018, and that's the same site now. Um, not only has the majority of it been destroyed, and this is a protected site, um, but they've used the stone to build up a mound to put the water tanks on to grow olives. So the, the, one of the main agents of destruction throughout the whole of the Middle East and North Africa is the expansion of agriculture, because there are more people that need feeding, and there's, there's a greater demand for water, so there are more dams, so there's more activity, and obviously there's, there's more agricultural activity as well. So it is, it, and as archaeologists, we know we can't prevent that, but what we want to be able to do is to try and protect the archaeological sites in advance of destruction, and if we can't protect them, then at least record them 
and have some investigation so that we can try and understand what they were. I mean, if we'd known this was happening, imagine the, the research excavation that could have taken place. And archaeologists only need a sample, they don't need to do everything, don't need to excavate everything, but this was just bulldozed away without anybody doing anything. Um, another example here, um, this is a, what we call a pendant burial, a prehistoric pendant burial. Um, taken. This is the, the photograph on the left taken uh, in 2009, and here it is uh, nine years later. That's the Azraq bypass. Obviously, Azraq needed a bypass, but again, uh, an opportunity lost in terms of the possible excavation of a pendant burial. Very few have been excavated, um, and and this, the the so whole landscapes are being damaged and affected by uh, activities that are just going on every day. And the archaeologists in the audience will know this book, but the engineers might not. Um, Ancient Jordan from the Air by David Kennedy and myself. This was kind of the the reason for getting involved was to be able to promote the archaeology and the history of Jordan by using air photography to show the breadth and that it isn't just Jarash and Petra. And I know that's a lovely picture of the, on the front cover of Jarash, but to show that there are many, many more sites um, available for, from all good bookshops in Amman, but especially from CBRL office um, just north of Souk Sultan. So do get in touch with Faraz or Carol or Shada or anybody. Um, and th there are still one or two copies left. Uh, now, the endangered archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa project was mentioned, and there's no doubt that the work that we'd done in Jordan helped for help develop the background for this project. And I'm not going to spend too long talking about it because that's a, sub, a whole other subject. But the purpose of the uh, Imina project, as we call it, abbreviating it, uh, was to look at satellite imagery from all the countries in the west, from Mauritania to east of Iran, um, 20 odd countries to try and assess how many archaeological sites could be recorded from satellite imagery and how many were under threat and what were the causes of those threats. And um, at the last count, there were over 300,000 sites already recorded and the main agents of destruction were agriculture, as I've mentioned, the expansion of towns and villages, road building, dam building, but also the impact of climate change, uh, looting, I'll mention that later as well, um, and conflict itself. So there are sort of five or six main agents of destruction, but the most damaging of all is agricultural activity and the not only the um, expansion of ag agricultural activity, but also the intensification using heavy machinery and the ability to bulldoze things very rapidly. Um, and there's just a distribution. This is a little bit old, um, probably a year or so old, but that's the distribution of, of, of the records that have been uh, made in the, the Amina database. And if you, if you go onto the Amina website, you can have a preview of all those archaeological sites. But that is the subject of a, of a, of a very different talk. Um, but uh, it, the project is still ongoing, and it's a partnership between Oxford University, Bristol, and Leicester. And it spawned other projects looking at the maritime archaeology in the Middle East, and now also Sub-Saharan Africa, a project that's going on in uh, the University of Cambridge. So the, everybody is aware just how much the cultural heritage is being damaged and destroyed uh, as we speak. What I want to do for the, the rest of the time is just talk about uh, what we've been able to do in both Oman and um, Saudi Arabia. And in 2017, the opportunities arose for both of those countries in a way we never thought it would. David and I used to, used to sort of dream about being able to fly in Saudi Arabia for many, many years, and we wrote many letters, and then suddenly things began to happen. Um, so let me just take you to Oman initially, and then we'll return to Saudi Arabia, and then I can and wrap it all up. Now, the Oman project came about because of uh, this chap here, who happens to be Jordanian, uh, Sufyan al Karema, he's, he's a, a native of Umkais, but now it works in Leiden and uh, is an archaeologist and does do work in Jordan as well. But he had contacts through uh, the fact that he worked in, in Leiden with other archaeologists in Oman. And he said, what about us doing a project in Oman? So in 2018, we went and just as a, as a test and uh, we were 
very, you know, we were uh, welcomed and we were allowed one flight in this Puma aircraft, which fortunately now has been decommissioned. As you can see, it's not the newest looking of helicopters, but it has plenty of space. And we did about four hours in it and refueled and it, and it just proved how useful aerial archaeology could be in Oman. And then we went back in 2019. Again, the request was that we not only train local archaeologists as best we could, but also write a book on the uh, history of an Oman using air photography. So we went back in 2019, did three flights, um, and it's a large country. There's many. There's much more to do. So that's why um, I'm going back. As of Sunday, I'm going to be there for three weeks. And um, aerial archaeology is a bit of a. You've got to be very flexible. Uh, we don't even know if we've got permission to fly, or when we'll be flying, or who we'll be flying with. Now that's happened many times in Jordan before. Um, so I'll either go and be very, very busy and won't get a moment to myself, or I'll go and actually it'll end up being a bit of a holiday because um, we won't be able to go flying. But that's OK. Um, and we'll do some field work as well. So these are just a, a few examples of the photography we do. And that's uh, some of the people we were working with. Uh, the chap in the middle, NASA, is, a, is definitely the Mr. Fix-It. He's an archaeologist, works for the Ministry of Culture. And uh, these were two of them. Um, Amira works in the GIS department. And Waleed does too. So um, hopefully we'll renew up their acquaintance in, next week. We were given two different helicopters. The um, this is an, an EU one uh, NH90, which is the perfect vehicle. It's large, it's fast, it can fly for three hours of re refueling. Um, but we only had that for one day. On the other days we had the Superlynx, which is the when it was first introduced was the fastest helicopter uh, anywhere, British built, but it only has a duration of two hours. And then they said, oh, we've got to refuel. What they didn't tell us was they refuel from uh, drums and, and, hand, and had to hand pump all the fuel from the drum into that. So that took half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, but, you know, that's hard work. And the pilots do it themselves. So it was really hard work for them. So no wonder they weren't, didn't really like us going for six hours at a time. Uh, now, one of the uses of satellite um, imagery is to, is to locate the sites in advance and we use what do we call the google earth pins and we drop the pins of where we want to photograph and then we upload that onto a gps we take the gps in the air and we're able to then direct the pilots where we want to go and with the with the more advanced helicopters in jordan we use a black hawk um that they've got gps as well so we just give them a number so uh we if it's flight if it's the first flight we'll call it a and the first leg will be a1 and they'll say, right, we'll just go to number A1 because it doesn't matter what it is. Um, we just want to get there. And, and it's a very, very efficient system. So it works very well. Uh, until GPS, it was literally just using paper maps. And that was a real trial. And then we, the, the, the GPS records the log. So all the white things you see there are where we've orbited and taken a photograph. And then somebody has to then catalog all that and uh, create all the metadata with the, with the, the image and that image is then uploaded to the Apami website so that everybody, any, anybody, anywhere in the world can see them. And so the photography that we did in October 2021 in Jordan is being uploaded to the Apami website uh, this week. I've got the fourth flight should finish tonight and the fifth flight, depending on time, I might get it done before I go to Amman or not, I might not, but we'll see. Uh, and one other thing to say is there is, I'll come back to this, but there is a worldwide shortage of aerial archaeologists, but we're trying to address that. Um, and we don't just take pictures of archaeology, we take pictures of um, things in the landscape. One of the things in Oman is the changing, the rapidly changing uh, way in which the traditional fishing was done and is done because it becomes more uh, industrialized and more commercial. So when we were flying along the coast, I just took a few images to show, uh, as it were, the local fishermen and each one with his or her own hut. Um, and hopefully that will be a tradition that won't die out because it's gone on for probably thousands of years. Um, and for those of you who've been to Oman, you know that the fish is just fantastic. Um, I, I show this one. It's not archaeological, it's geological. But whenever we're flying, the people were with the pilots and the crewmen. They all know their landscape very well. And they say, you must see this. So they always take you to places that you wouldn't uh, otherwise have no, either known about I mean, this is a very popular uh, place to go. So I am hoping to visit on the ground. I've, I've, I've only photographed it from the air, but it's a, it's a sinkhole in the limestone. And there, apparently you can see the steps down just maybe um, where people go swimming. 
and there is somebody swimming there if you've got the eyesight to see it. Um, but the story of Oman in terms of its history is very much to do with forts and towers. And I've been reliably informed that there are 5,000 towers and 3,000 castles and forts. Now that makes a total of 8,000 targets. There is no way anybody could ever get around to photograph all of them. Um, so we're trying to go for a selection and try and understand them. As you can see, some of them are in very good condition uh, that have been restored. And uh, I'm just gonna run through a few others. Here's a, another good one that's been, that's been well looked after. And they represent a whole range of, of reasons for building the fort. Sometimes it's, it's defending against each other, the Omanids against other Omanis, but the vast majority are to try and defend against people wanting to take a piece of their territory. Because of the where Oman is and its, and its position on the trade route from Africa to India, which has been a very, very important trade route for thousands of years, um, there are people who've landed and wanted to um, invade their country and invade parts of their country, so they built forts to keep them out. And uh, why wouldn't you? Um, and one of the quiz questions I've got is, does anybody know what who, until 1862 where the capital of Oman was? So you can answer that at the end. Um, and sometimes the, the tower is in better nick than the rest of the castle because it's easy to restore it. But again, I think actually taking these photographs helps monitor uh, what things are looking at. Sometimes you might argue uh, that there has been some over restoration. Um, this is a place called Havy Fort and Castle. Um, presumably a beautiful place to visit and have a look at, but you can see that it's been, it's been heavily restored. And, but around it, you can see there was a settlement and an oasis. You can see the water management systems through the date palm and everything else. So you are able from the air to understand things in their context as well. Um, and this one I particularly like because you've got the fort on the top and the towers here protecting the settlement. And you might think it's naturally defended anyway because it's in the dip slope behind the thing, but they clearly needed uh, the lookout for lookout towers and the forts as well. Uh, this is one of my favourite locations. We just we weren't we weren't intending to photograph this, but as we orbited, I thought that's an amazing piece of rock. Let's just take a photograph of it. And then I realised there were features on top, um, and it's not far from the one of the castles I just showed earlier, um, with a sheer drop down here, and pretty difficult to get to from any side. Um, so I want to find out more about what really is on the top there, and why on earth were they. Uh, living up there or trying to, to make some statement from the top of this amazing cliff. Um, and there it is in slightly more detail, uh, just showing, I mean, it looks to me like an enormous uh, water system, which is interesting. Um, maybe it's maybe it's a big, uh, I don't know, a swimming pool or something, but I, I don't know. And then there are these other features as well. So clearly more work is needed. Um, other sites like this. And the other reason for showing these is to just show you how well preserved so many of them are and therefore hoping that they can be maintained and preserved as well as they are today, even though, as you see, there's a four lane highway not so far away. So that's just a quick run through the, the first couple of seasons at Oman. We're hoping that will continue for a bit longer. Um, none of this can happen by any one person alone. It is teamwork. Um, so there are archeologists in that, in that group, but the main people are the two pilots and the crewmen and without them we wouldn't be able to do it so i'm very grateful to to all of them for making it happen um often the pilots just just look at us and go what do you want us to do orbit around for three hours flying high and slow we're helicopter pilots we want to fly low and fast um and then just to add in we also try whenever possible to be able to go and visit um clearly we can never visit all the sites on the ground but one, once or twice we see sites that we've we've really enjoyed looking at, so we try and uh, visit those as well. Uh, now we'll just go um, to Alula in northern Saudi Arabia. Uh, many of you will either have heard of it or been there, uh, but in the coming years you will definitely hear more about it and hopefully we'll be able to visit. Um, it is a phenomenal part of, of the world, um, fantastic natural landscapes, but wonderful archaeological landscapes too. Um, and the, the current uh, ruling people in, in Saudi Arabia set up a vision 2030 to increase tourism to this part of Saudi Arabia. Um, 
because it is a, just a wonderful place to be, such a variety of landscapes um, and places to visit. Um, and it's the, this is the Royal Commission for Alula, and here's the helipad here. Um, and they've opened up this new park here where you can get wonderful um, Dunkin' Donuts or coffee uh, after your flight on after a long day. But the, getting the right time of year and flying there, it is just stunning. Um, this is a project that's being run through the University of Western Australia, um, run by Hugh Thomas, uh, but also many of the people that we worked with in Jordan because they're aerial archaeologists, they've been working out in, in this area. And I was lucky enough to help set up the project and then last year was able to go um, for a short while. Uh, the great thing about uh, Saudi Arabia is that there is um, enough money to be able to uh, have helicopters. This was the one we used in 2020, was absolutely brand new. And I was just chatting to the people who were there in 2021 and they also used another new helicopter. This one had only fly, flown 40 hours by the time we were there. Um, and a very good platform for doing what we're doing, fast and steady. Um, and I put this on just to show that you do need the light, you need the contrast and the shadow. And so flying in November, December, the reason we're going to a man in January is you really wouldn't, I don't think the light would be good enough from probably from late February, certainly early March. It just would, it's very frustrating when you get to a place and you orbit it, and the light is so strong, you don't see the contrast. So we need the contrast between the light and the shade. And, and I just put that in. Um, obviously, when the time of year is, is important, but occasionally in November, there are clouds. And one day it even rained, and we'll come back to that later. Um, so that is a bit of a trade-off. Sometimes you just have to say, sorry, the weather's not good enough today, we'll land and go, some, go on another day. But predominantly, the weather is good enough to be able to do it. So you do have to have a bit of a trade-off. One of the other questions we often get is, well, how do you actually take the photos? Now, obviously this is a bit of a mock-up, but it's just as Matt Dalton on the left and myself, it is handheld cameras leaning out, um, not leaning out too much because you don't want to be in the slipstream, um, but you can see the cameras we're using digital, uh, we happen to use Nikons, um, and then the, the GPS on our knees so that we can communicate with the pilot where we're going and where the next target is. So it's not, it's not high tech in that sense. Um, because it's about, the, it is an archaeological survey. It just happens to be undertaken at 70 or 80 knots and cover literally thousands of kilometers every year. Um, and it's a very, very efficient way of recording uh, information. Uh, others probably in the audience could give a lecture on the old town in Alula um, that would go on for two or three hours and would be fascinating. It is an amazing uh, story of this old town here of Alula. Uh, there's now the modern town of Alula, and this has been abandoned, was abandoned, I think, in the late 60s and early 70s. But from a, from a, a cultural heritage point of view, the question is, what do we do with, or how do you preserve and present over, I think there are 900 houses here or something of that order. Um, uh, and they've preserved one or two very well. And we were lucky enough to go and uh, have a wander through some of those that they've conserved and some that they haven't. And maybe the answer is to have a whole a different range of very well preserved, not at all preserved, and something in the middle to actually have a look to see how you could preserve it because they're mud brick. They're not designed to last forever. They're not designed to be re renewed and rebuilt and everything else. Um, but if nobody's living there, why would you do that? So the big challenge as to how you present something like this, and that's one of many, many oasis towns right across Arabia. Um, and there's just a view of um, an Ottoman fort uh, on the top here um, and the, the landscape views. It is one of the most, apart from probably Monument Valley and um, what's the famous gorge that I've forgotten the name of uh, in, in America, um, this is unequivalent with anything like that. Uh, it is absolutely fantastic. Um, and then there are these wonderful limestone features called yardangs. Uh, which are just these vertical limestone things that you see all over the place. Um, and they're just a, a wonderful feature in the landscape um, form, formed over, over millions of years of both uh, sedimentation and then erosion. Um, and you could just spend, even if you weren't an archaeologist, just to go there and do the photographs of the landscape would be just fantastic. So what is it the audience wants to know when it comes to the archaeology? Well, my wife gave me this tip. She said, basically, they want to know how old is it and how big is it? So um, for the next few slides, I'm actually 
been able to say how large things are and what date they are. And this is a fort in, as part of um, a city. Uh, I put city in inverted commas. It's a, it's a very large settlement. Um, and they were just excavating this. And the fort dates from the 8th to the 5th century uh, BCE. There's many more pictures I could show you, but in we only have an hour, so I don't want to go on too long. Um, but again, it's good to see that these are being excavated under proper archaeological conditions, so we can understand a bit more about uh, what, how, why the people were living there, why they needed to defend it. But obviously, if you live in an oasis, you clearly need to be able to protect it. And uh, that's about 55 metres square. This is one of my favourite sites. We happened to, literally, we were coming into land in Alula, um, Um Daraj, um, which means mother of steps, I believe. Um, and each of the enclosures there are about 30 metres in length, um, and you can see them on the hilltop. Um, they are clearly sanctuaries, temples. You, you couldn't possibly live up here, and the, the small excavations that have taken place, uh, the artefacts suggest that they are um, for ritual purposes um, and clearly special places that, that we all have in our societies, whether it's cathedrals or mosques or whatever else, There's, these are important sacred places. And there's just another view of it, the sanct this, the, the, what's called the sanctuary here. Um, I would, I've not been up to visit it, but it would be a fantastic walk to do that one day. Uh, I put that in partly to, to say I need to just check the time, um, but also prehistoric enclosures. Uh, presumably this is some sort of burial, but we don't exactly know what this is. Uh, and why there are these divisions in it, but there are now these research teams working on that to try and work that out for us. Um, and then south of Alula, it also became apparent that, that it isn't just, the you know, the archaeology is important in Alula, but then there is Kaibar, this amazing oasis, um, and the famous battle of, of, of Kaibar, and uh, really important battle in, in Islamic history, um, but then when you photograph and see the, the, the not just one hilltop settlement, but three of them with their more modern uh, mud brick around them in this huge oasis, it's a really, really important part of, of uh, human history, uh, which haven't really got time to go into. And you could, you could, one of the things that aerial archaeology does is it just throws up so many opportunities for research. Um, you could easily put a team of people in there for 10 years and they would literally only scratch the surface because the, the, the archaeology goes from everything from the 7th millennium BC right up to the present day. Um, and there's just a detail of, of some of the, the old houses uh, and the mud brick houses, which, you know, if left untouched, they will just melt away. They will just disappear. Uh, whereas the stone built ones on the top, they will survive longer. Um, and this is one of the... the uh, types of site that until the surveys in Saudi began, no one had ever recorded or knew. Um, initially, they were referred to as gates, um, but that didn't really mean anything to the local Arab population. So they called them mustatil. Um, and I believe mustatil means rectangular or rectangle in Arabic. Is that right? Um, but the, these now have been, a few of them have been uh, investigated and excavated and it looks as if they are 7th millennium BC, so 9,000 years ago. Um, and exactly what they are, I think the jury is still out because also they're reused over time. Um, and there are tunnel entrances here. Um, I've walked up a few of these and inside there's, there's no very few flints, very little pottery. You know, what, what are these for? Um, they tend to be on a slope as well. Uh, so there's, there's, although some research has happened, there's much, much more. And there are hundreds of them. I mean, here you're just seeing one, but there are hundreds. And then there are these other sites, uh, which many of you in the audience I know know about, the prehistoric hunting traps, the kites. They're called kites because these long string things, particularly in Jordan, um, the, the long strings and then the enclosures looked to the early RAF pilots as if they were kites in the landscape. And then you have these huge, these holes here. Um, and the, 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 the latest theory uh, as a result of a project done by Remy Crassard and other French archeologists is that actually the, the gazelle were, were corralled into these areas because this is for hunting uh, oryx or gazelle um, and they would be corralled into here and they would then be 
either spooked or dispersed. And, and if there was, you know, 100 of these gazelle in here, they, some of them would fall into here and then others would fall into here because the excavations, there are very few that have been excavated. There are thousands of these sites all the way from Yemen up to Kazakhstan. Um, only a very small number, fewer than 10 have ever been excavated. Uh, they're finding the gazelle bones in the bottom of these, uh, these pits. And um, this is just an example. We landed the helicopter and this is Matt Dalton and I. I just wanted to show, um, you know, Matt's nearly six foot and then that's the drop. Um, and he's standing above this one here just to show the scale of it. So that's a, that's a big thing. Initially, we, people had thought that this was where the huntsmen hid and, and, and used their bows and arrows to shoot the gazelle, but that's not the case at all. Um, and then the other, I'm just gonna run through a few of these, which is these amazing, uh, sometimes we call these keyhole, but they're tri triangular shaped things. And what the archeologists who've been this, working on these have found is that what's important is also the gap in between them. And they've written an article about the avenues between these things, because it's actually, these are on long distance routes. Um, the presumption is that they're to do with burial, um, but there are different sizes. And again, you can see how there is a route running through here. Um, and again here. So it isn't just about the thing itself, it's also by the gaps in between those. Um, and here's another one with amazing extension here. Um, but again, the avenue you can see running through and then another one running through here as well. Um, and that one, you know, so why is that? Is that a very large family um, from something starting initially here and then being expanded and expanded? Um, you know, we know so little about them. Um, and again, here you can see this is, this is a satellite image of, of some of the similar areas, but it gives you an idea of, of all these avenues that are running through here and, and through here. Um, really important. And then uh, just to, just to, this is literally just come out uh, in 2021, that these avenues constructed during the mid to late third millennium, so that's 2,500 to 2,000 before the common era, uh, thousands of, thousands of kilometers, um, which they, we believe to be funerary avenues, uh, not surprisingly between major uh, water sources, um, and very important that we look at those roots of human movement, which have gone on for uh, literally thousands of years. Um, and then also when we do visit on the ground, the number of, of sites that have got rock art. Now, obviously aerial archeology span can't help with rock art, but it just shows why it's important to visit uh, as many of these sites as possible, because the rock art is really, really important to try to understand um, who, the, who the people were and the animals that were there as well. Uh, and then I did tell, say that um, it does rain, and this was in 2020, we had two thunderstorms, and I was, I was surprised, even though I have seen flash floods and other things, that just how quickly the landscape can change as a result of, they were pretty big and pretty large thunderstorms, um, but these, the, the wadis fill up very, very quickly um, and can transform the landscape immediately. Um, this is where we visited one, the pilot was very keen uh, to try and have a look at it, um, because it's a bit like when it snows in Britain, we all go out and play in the snow. Uh, the same when it rains in, in, in parts of Saudi Arabia, understandably so. Um, I was worried the pilot was going to fall in. He was so keen to get into the middle of the thing. He did admit the next day that he dropped his phone in the water taking a picture um, and it was drying out, but it did it did repair. But that's quite a, that's quite a stream. Um, and usually we're used to seeing them without any water. Uh, just a couple of other examples of some phenomenal uh, wall building. This is a very, this is probably two or 3,000 feet high. Uh, you can see the wall running all the way down here and across to here. Quite incredible. Um, why you would build that for what is presumably to do with burial, because there's a burial on one end um, and a burial on the other. And the pilot's interpretation of that was that um, it was a married couple who didn't get on. So the husband's buried here and the wife's buried on the other side, which I thought wasn't a bad idea. Um, and then uh, lots of other little, the, the, the small, what we call bullseyes, you see them in the landscape. And then wherever you see a bullseye, you generally get a triangle as well. There's nowhere else that I've seen this anywhere in the world. It's a phenomenal, triangular features are very unusual anyway, um, but actually to have them clearly, they're pointing to each other. 
Now, are they representing um, male and female? We just don't know. We just don't know. Uh, more work is needed on all of these, but there then they are everywhere. They are literally everywhere. Um, and then I just put this one in because again, you get um, these larger ones with segments in them, but then as often there's the path going through and damaging them because you know that that's probably more recent and not one of the ancient avenues because I'm sure this would have had a uh, a thing on the end. Uh, so that's very important. And there's another one, and I just wanted to put this one on to make the point about virtually all the sites we see um and it is literally 99.9 percent .9%, somebody has been in there and had a look um in terms of looting uh in prehistory or often uh more recently and um one of the reasons we did the photography we did in october in jordan was to try and assess whether there's been more looting as a result of uh, the lockdown and the the reduction in economic um activity so where did all the basalt come from and here's a fact i didn't know until i was listening to bbc's perfect planet with david attenborough 80 percent of the earth's land mass is derived from our volcanoes that's amazing and this we came across this the white volcano in jordan quite a phenomenal place um uh, to, to to be able to fly around and and see it it is just magnificent and although this is a long way south from Alula and quite a bit east from Kaibar. Um, what a wonderful thing this would be if it could be opened up for people to visit and, and do mountain climbing. There's a whole story of the history of the earth from, from these places. Um, I mean, imagine this thing erupting. That must have had an impact on the world. Um, and then I mentioned the Mustatils. This is one where it's just one section of a Mustatil, but pointing straight at the white volcano. Uh, very important. And then uh, just another another one that's not quite the same. And I don't think I've got Yes. And then this is the one where you've actually got a bullseye with a great long pendant on it as well. Um, but, you know, well visited by people in four by fours having a look at it because they can. Um, and that's, again, the balance of tourism over tourism is is both a, a, a great thing for archaeology, but it's also an agent of destruction as well. And I just wanted to show too that the, the 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 volcanoes have been erupting over and over again. This is the old basalt, and this is the more recent basalt, probably within the last five thousand years. Um, and there is no question that this is more recent than when these were built. And these may well have been built in the third millennium, second millennium BC. So this has happened since then. Um, and it's only when you visit on the ground you can actually see the lava has crept right up to the edge. There is no doubt that these are older than that more, more recent lava. Um, and there's another one of the triangular ones as well that you can see. And there it is again. And it's almost as if the, the archaeology has, has almost preserved itself because the lava can't quite get up there. Um, but there will be many, many um, I'm sure there was much more. You can see this slightly different lava here. So there's a lot of archaeology was destroyed by the lava. That's to remind me time to wrap up. Um, again, we did lots of field work as best we can. Um, and there's the team that was doing it. We were able to land in the desert, which was fantastic. Sometimes we landed in the kite itself. So the field work was very rapid, which is a wonderful way of doing field work, uh, much better than uh, in a four by four where too many tires get blown up and uh, but we were saved here by an, an Ethiopian camel herder who who insisted we drank camel milk um we did we didn't drink much of it um and, but he was very good on the tea so that was fantastic and for one week the uh the VIPs took our helicopter so I had to go back to being an excavator uh using buckets and a brush and a shovel and uh, as you can see I was happy as Larry it was wonderful um and now finally, just wanted to say a little bit about Nabataean cities. We've already talked about Petra. I couldn't uh, not talk about uh, Hedra or Madin Salah in, in northern Saudi Arabia. Uh, the French have been working here for many, many years, but we were able, um, and I know the team this year were able to fly with, also with Jane Taylor, um, to take some stunning views of, of uh, the fantastic uh, archeological sites and tombs at Madin Salah. So I just wanted to show a few in the, in the evening light that we were able to take um, and the different the different types of tomb you know if you were wealthy this is what you had uh, if you were less wealthy 
you were stuck on the top of the hill, but clearly uh, still very important places. And then this is the center that's being excavated, the center of the actual city, very, very different structure to Petra, much more open. Uh, but if any of you uh, get the chance to, to visit, I would say this is on a par with Petra. Um, it's really a stunning place to visit, it really is. Um, and I wanted to take a lower picture of this, um, but there were these people here. And if you're in a helicopter, you don't want to upset the VIPs below. Um, so that was as low as the pilots would let us go, but absolutely wonderful, wonderful place to visit and see. And again, thanks to the pilots and everybody else. Um, and then I just want to finish with a few slides of what's next. Um, I, my view is that um, it's time for me to hang up my wings um, and, and uh, retire into the sunset. So training, training, training. I've got two grants um, that are current at the moment, one from the British Academy and one from the Society of Antiquaries, to try and train the next generation. So we've got an Egyptian, Mohammed Kanawi, who works for the Amina Project. He's very keen to, to learn air photography and hopefully do it in, in Egypt one day. Um, and then Sufyan, I've already mentioned, who's being trained. Firaz no longer needs training. He's just a brilliant stalwart of, of air photography. Although I do need to teach him how to catalog so that I don't spend the whole of my Christmas cataloging. Um, and we were, we were also joined by Basha uh, Tabar who um, runs the Amman International Hotel, but also is a very, very good photographer. Um, and I recommend you look at his website, Map and Lens, but he, he, he comes with us and takes some wonderful photographs. So that's very good. Um, and then also Dana Salamine, who works for the Department of Antiquities. Um, she's also learning. So we're hoping that in the next few weeks, both Dana and Faraz and Mohammed can join us in Oman so we can continue the training. Because as I mentioned earlier, there's a worldwide shortage. And I just wanted to show a few pictures we took in October. Um, this is one of Madaba, which some of somebody mentioned that in the introduction. Um, it is so we don't just photograph archaeological sites. We are interested in both the modern uh, anything really that that can be considered uh, archaeology of whatever date, um, whether it's prehistory or more recent. We were able to fly over Hezban. The archaeologists there asked us to do it, so we have literally hundreds of photographs that are now uploaded to the website of Hezban. I think they uploaded yesterday. Um, Casa Bushir, one of my favourite places. Um, uh, in Jordan, just a wonderful uh, Roman governor's palace uh, with an inscription here that tells you who it was, Aurelius Asclepiades and the date. Um, and we had a close look at who the people in this van were. I think they were just having a picnic. Um, if they were looters, they'd, they'd only recently stopped. But the other reason for visiting again was just to see how many looting holes uh, appear and reappear. And then we also got very excited um, flying over what we thought were Roman sites, because that's what we were told they were, but clearly these are prehistoric ritual sites on the Karak Plateau, um, and not really understood. So there's another area for future research, and they're connected by this avenue, um, and there are probably eight or nine of those circular enclosures all connected by this avenue, and it's a very well-built avenue as well. Um, we visited on the ground um, uh, with Basho and I in November, so uh, much more to have a look at. And then just wanted to show this too, where, uh, you know, uh, substantial, um, probably Roman and maybe early in Abertean, but you can see very large looting holes there uh, on these sites. And then uh, as we speak, I'm just planning the trip for um, uh, the, to Oman. And that's just the overview of what I've got to do for the rest of today and tomorrow and put those all on a database and upload them to the GPS so that we can go. And there we are, finished, 1704. All done. Thank you. Any questions? It's all gone quiet. Are you muted, Knife? Professor Knife, you're muted. Uh, uh, um, uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, informative and interesting presentation with some discoveries for us that. Uh, aerial photos now can have a new approach in archaeology that we can discover a lot of archaeological sites that have been uh, unknown. This is very important, but with monitoring and risk assessment that it's very important issue for the future of aerial uh, or uh, uh, let us say uh, aerial archaeology and remote sensing which work together. So. Uh, this is my first uh, note, but 
I will now open the floor for questions. Then I would like to ask you some questions at the end. Yeah, fine. So the floor is open. And if there is any question, please. Yes. OK. Can I please. ask? Go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much. Uh, but I want to ask you uh, about the photogrammetry and leaders. How can we use it in uh, civil engineer? Um, in terms of photogrammetry, the, the, what yes. I try and do, for, for, for example, at Hezban, we try to take as many pictures as possible so that for yes, those exactly. who have the expertise, you would be able to then do a 3D reconstruction. Yes. Um, but primarily, um, it, that's not our purpose. It is for the discovery and the monitoring. Um, and I think that, that maybe that's where drones come into their own in terms of being able to do a much more detailed survey from a lower level. So you could then do a photogrammetric 3D reconstruction. Is that is that what you meant? OK, thank you. Please, if there's another question. If there is any question, please, the floor is open for questions. No question? No, you ask yours then. Oh, yeah, there's one. Her oh, Henry. yeah, yeah, yeah. Henry. Please open the mic, Professor Henry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much, Robert, um, for, for a, a fascinating presentation. Um, I, I, there may be a difficult one to answer, but I think um, there was a very old site uh, that you showed in Saudi Arabia. I think it was called Dedan or Dedan, I don't know. Yeah. Five to 8,000 BCE. Um, I mean, do you have any idea, which you can't clean it from aerial archaeologists, what sort of people would have been uh, inhabiting that area around that sort of time? I, mean, I had no idea that it went back so far. Would there have been pastoralists, nomads, uh, settled people or what? Well, uh, Dedan, I think it was eight. It was it wasn't thousand. It was hundred. So eighth oh, to fifth sorry, century yeah. BC. Yeah. Um, and so, but at, at that time, they would have been. This is one of the difficulties in archaeology, in that we, I think, archaeologists have oversimplified um, the whole business of of um, sedentary and pastoral. I think generally people are moving much more than we give them credit for even though there may have been what seemed to us as archaeologists permanent settlements and especially i think in in arabia where movement is really important and because of the way the oases so there would be some people who might live there the whole year round and some not so i think it was a much more fluid system but we know that it, at that time there were there was you know, language is developed, writing is developed, you know, it, so it's not that much different. Uh, there will be others in the audience who know much, much more about that than I do. Um, but but I, so, so it is essentially a settled community, but there would be a lot of movement as well. I think that's probably the fairest answer I can give. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Yes, can I ask a question here, please? Yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation for uh, scenes and pictures, which uh, we would never thought that they, 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 they were here in Jordan, especially in Jordan. One interesting thing, which uh, uh, could you please uh, explain more about it? That, uh, that the huge circle, which is uh, 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 an ancient volcano, very large volcano, uh, you showed in one of the slides. Was that in Jordan or in uh, in uh, northern Saudi Arabia? No, that's that's in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, what exactly in Al in Al Ula area? In Al Ula no, area? So, it, it's south, about a hundred and oh, it was a long old flight, but probably one hundred and fifty kilometers south from Al Ula. Hundred and how much? One hundred and fifty kilometers. One hundred and fifty. Yeah, Maybe. Okay. Well, well. Uh, okay, that was a fantastic view, a fantastic picture. It was, that. It, yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and obviously it's very high up. We have the door, it was freezing. We were at about seven and a half thousand feet. I have never been so wow. cold in all my life. You but should have been uh, working uh, some uh, warm uh, clothes. <laughs> yeah. 
but uh, uh, again, uh, could that be seen from the uh, Google Earth? Uh, yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think if you if you if you looked on Google Earth, I haven't, I haven't actually looked at it for a year or two, but if you if it it go east from Medina, um, yeah, and then yes. maybe slightly north of east from Medina, you'll find it because I'm pretty sure we we came and refueled in Medina, uh, right. From there, you, you'll find it on Google Earth. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Another question, please. There is question. Hello. Hello. Yeah, please. Uh, oh, Gary, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just want to say to Bob that some of us who are already doing work in these outrageously difficult areas in the Black Desert of Jordan appreciate what you and David and Rebecca have been doing for the last X decades, whatever it is. Um, it's very difficult to move in a lot of parts of that. And your movement in helicopters has made it much easier for us to select routes uh, in how we're gonna get from point A to point B out there. Um, but another question I think is very important Following in the footsteps of Richard Branston and Jeff Bezos, are you going to open up for tourism on a helicopter? <laughs> on Athame? It's funny you should say that. There is um, the the I, that was suggested to me by somebody that we could do. Well, you, I mean, we couldn't because we're working with the Royal Jordanian Air Force. And the thing about a helicopter is to do a trip as a fully commercial trip to say, visit some of the areas you're interested in, Gary. And um, while you're there, um, hopefully your photographs will be uploaded before I go to a man on Sunday, but it just depends on Flickr because it keeps busting on me. Um, <laughs> but it might be not till mid-Feb. Um, uh, but, it, but it would be so expensive. The problem is, I think the best, the best vehicle would be an airship. So in terms of tourism, if you could get airships to take 20 or 30 people and that could fly at say 30 or 40 kilometers uh, knots the problem is when you get the high wind yeah. that's the problem with the airship because then you would see the landscape at a, at a pace um, the trouble with air photography is in a helicopter unless you've got a strong stomach and if you have any motion sickness you are going to be found out so it's not for everybody and if somebody's say somebody's paid let's say a thousand pounds to go for an hour in a helicopter um, and then they're sick half the time, it's not going to go down very well, is it? But airships, <laughs> airships would be fantastic. I went in an airship in England in the 1990s when they did it from Cardington. And I thought this is the best way to travel. And the pilot said, we've got to land. I said, why? He said, well, the wind's too strong. We, we're going to end up in Paris if we don't stop. I said, well, I don't want to go to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, it's a good question. It would be really good if we could afford it. It's just that helicopters are very expensive. Sure. May I say something? They're yeah, already please. doing helicopter trips in Alula, so you can go and view Hegra and um, Dadan and other places um, by helicopter um, at at a price. Needless. I was going to say, say. I, I didn't know that. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. Hello. But um, the other, may I make two other comments? Um, firstly, on what uh, Henry Hogger said, um, I was talking to uh, Jerome Roma, who's one of the co-directors of the Dadan excavation when I was there um, last month. And he said, oh, I, I begged him to translate the archeology span into the history or the story um, of the place. And he said, they're just not, you know, in a position to do that at the moment, which is very difficult for me because I'm trying to write about it. Um, the other comment I wanted to make was about the, the kiss tombs that you showed in Hegra. And there is some thinking now that they, it may not just be an economic issue, yeah. but that they are very likely older tombs oh, um, thank from you. earlier people who were living there, Before. as some of the ones that were carved into the rock faces were also earlier. 
Thank you. And I uh, just noticed in the chat, somebody said that does does the Im do the images have the GPS locations in in a palm? And the answer is yes. If you if you look at the image, you can go to the data EXIF data and get it. So they're, they're all there. They're all geolocated. And if you find any mistakes, that's my fault. <laughs> Okay, we have, and if there is any question, please. I would like to ask you, Robert, about your feeling. At the moment, you are on the air and you saw something new for you. This is one question, your feeling and how your reaction for this uh, moment and for this discovery. This is the first. The second about the shadow, how you are dealing with the shadow sometimes, the, um, the perfect times for uh, taking photos. Yeah. Um, very interesting you say that because archaeologists, what excites archaeologists is finding stuff. And it doesn't matter whether it's if you're excavating recently, they've just found a, a wonderful Roman mosaic, a farmer, a farmer and his son found a Roman mosaic, which shows the the, um, the battle of, of um, Hector and Patroclus or whatever. And the excitement is finding something actually that that has been buried for and actually it doesn't matter how long, 100 years, 1000 years, 5000 years. And it's that that's that's part of the excitement. Um, and also, you don't want to destroy something unnecessarily. So usually we try and approach things so that they're under threat. The great thing about archaeology from the air is it's non-destructive. And we actually had a moment in October where we were orbiting these sites, those ritual sites that I was showing in the Karak Plateau. And Firaz says, Bob, this is the Stonehenge of, of Jordan. And I went, oh, that's maybe going a bit far. But the excitement was there because what we'd expected was a series of Roman sites because the area we were working is where Tom Parker had worked and also David was very interested in. So there were lots of pins saying Roman this, Roman this. Roman. And they said tower. They weren't towers at all. They were circular prehistoric enclosures. And next to them are some rectangular enclosures that aren't mentioned. But when we visited on the ground, those rectangular enclosures have got huge limestone slabs. They're also burials. So it, it's, it is that, that journey of reinterpretation and discovery that happens all the time. And the, clo the more you look, the more you find. Um, and then there's the opposite side where you get to a site and you see it's been completely trashed. And you go, yeah. you know, that is, is just heartbreaking. And then the schedule, you say, in terms of the flying, um, my, in, now I would say the best time for flying in Jordan is from mid-October through to mid-February, but the weather can be pretty awful. Um, but the light is perfect for what we want to do. We have tended, for other reasons of scheduling that weren't to do with archaeology, we've tended to fly more often in, in May and September, October. I'm now trying to push it so we do more in the winter, which may mean we may have more days when we can't fly because of the weather. But when you do fly, and Jane knows this only too well, Jane has taken the best, the best aerial photograph I think I've ever seen of Machiris that she has on the front cover of books and everywhere, because you took the time to say the light will be perfect at 6.32 a.m. I need to be there on April or whatever it is because it will be lovely and green. Um, and as archaeologists, we're looking for the best conditions. So in Britain, we were always looking to fly when either there'd been a hot, dry summer or you're flying in the winter to get the earthworks and monitor through the earthworks. And the, there are there are 30,000 protected sites in England, archaeological sites. The best way of monitoring them is using air photography. So instead of asking people to monitor it on the ground, now it, Historic England has a program of, of monitoring. And I think it would be wonderful if that could be set up in Jordan. Why not? Wouldn't that be magnificent? Oh, thank you. Another question, please. Can Robert, I have a question more, one yeah, more time, please? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, uh, could you please uh, show on the screen the website address uh, where we can uh, see these uh, images again? Yeah, I'll, if I just put it in the chat, 
it's it's very easy it's www dot a p a a m e dot oops dot org but i can oh, share no, my no, screen no. again i can a p a a m e yes yeah. Uh, me, uh, right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me just see if, if I share screen. Yeah. Um, because that literally, as I was talking, that this is, um, no, it doesn't show it there. But that's the website there. Right, okay, it is apaame.org. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Another question. No question. Any question, please? Yeah, somebody call me. Yes, please. Yeah, please. Why? Hi. Hi, Robert. Thank you for your interesting uh, lecture. It was amazing, really. And I had, uh, I have one question. You know, if all these photos are uploading to the, uh, to the internet, do you think this is, will be a threat for archaeology? And I think you uh, have been faced, you know, and you saw uh, many looting going on. And I'm asking about the access of all these photos. Mm. You know, who can access to, to these photos? Now, I think public, people, everybody. Yeah. You know, I was, I was in a, like a few weeks ago, I saw a, a, a huge uh, destroying going on in East Al Harra, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, people are looting, camping, digging, you know, yep. and they are using internet, GIS, uh, everything. They use a new technology. Do you think by uploading all these photos that would help looters, antiquitic thieves, you know, who they are digging every, every night, every day in, 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 in east north of Jordan? I think this is a big threat, you know, to upload all these photos. Uh, if we, I don't know how to find a solution for this. But this is would be a big help yeah. for them. Um, that's a really good point. And it's something we have been trying to grapple with for 30 or 40 years. We discovered in England, because in England we said, um, again, the air photographs are available to anybody who wants to see them. Um, we discovered that the metal detectorists knew before we knew where the sites were. They often had their own air survey teams, which surprised us, surprised us. So they were actually flying around even though we were. And we came to the conclusion that it's much better to try and use what we're doing as a way of educating people not to go out there. We, we faced it with the Endangered Archaeology Project as well as to how much information of the 300,000 um, sites that would be publicly available. So we've restricted the access so that you can see the dots in the landscape, but you can't get the detail. But most people have given us the information and fed back that actually the local population know where the sites are long before archaeologists do, and they know where to loot. And as I said, you know, most of the tombs, many, many, the picture of me in that tomb, that had been robbed many, many years ago, if not thousands of years ago. And we did find the remnants of a, of a necklace in the sand in the bottom, tiny little pieces of, of, of bone. Um, so it, it, does, it does concern me that by publishing them, we might do that, but I actually think people who are gonna go and loot already know where they're gonna go, even before they look at a palmy. And, and I think that's the case, but I, I, it, is a, it is a real issue. As archaeologists, we have a duty to share our research and our work. And therefore, I, you know, the, the decision we've made is it's better to share that research and, than to keep it to ourselves. There would be no point in me having all that information on a hard drive that nobody could use. Um, you know, and as Gary has just said, Gary Rolleston saying, you know, the, the, the work that we've done does allow the research to happen. It is, but you're right, it's a real issue that we have, that we are trying to struggle with. But you know that that's the view we've taken for a um because actually the number of sites we're photographing in any one year is a very small percentage of what's there okay thank you but thank you for raising it yeah thank it's, you. A, it's a big thank issue you. thank you it is thank you we have time for two questions 
Let's see. Okay, if there is any question. Uh, some, okay. Sorry, somebody just put in the chat. I think these images can be shown in the exhibitions at the Jordan Museum as well. For more yeah, there. yeah. It's a really good point. And um, uh, we uh, have the director here and he can <laughs> say his word. And I actually have an exhibition that was shown in the Royal Geographical Society for in 2018, which is in boxes in Oxford. And I'd be more than happy to ship it out and update it. It would be fantastic to do. But not this week or next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe sure next year. It's a good uh, idea. Yeah, no, thank idea. you very much. Question about this. So. I believe we are done. Yes. Yes. So thank you all. And thanks, uh, Dr. Robert, for this informative and very, let us say, a new approach in archaeology that we have to consider here in the Arab world. And I believe that it is the beginning of this school in uh, aerial archaeology and remote sensing. But uh, what about remote sensing uh, for the future here in Jordan? To finish with this, because we saw only mainly uh, aerial photographs. But, I am uh, not wrong. I mean, the remote, I think Jordan has, has actually blazed the trail in allowing us to do what we do. And the remote sensing can come from um, both training in the inter because really the, the key thing is inter it's training in the interpretation of the images. There mm -hmm. are more images than we can ever possibly have. Um, and I think that that should be the next stage in terms of training yeah. people in the interpretation of the existing satellite imagery. Yeah. Um, part of the problem is that the publicly available imagery is good enough up to a certain level. You then have to spend quite a lot of money to get the more, um, the higher resolution satellite imagery. Yeah. Um, you know, the minimum spend can be $3,000. That's quite a lot of money for a researcher. Um, so, but, but the, to me, it's about training in both interpretation and access to that information. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So again, thank you. And we can close the session. And we hope that we will organize another lecture uh, with the new discoveries uh, from your side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all Thank for you. your uh, with being uh, with us, and it was very nice. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Robert. Thank you, Dr. Nayef, Professor Nayef. Thank you, everybody, for joining this uh, very interesting and informative lecture. Uh, and really, it takes us on a fantastic journey to those uh, sites. And we are looking forward to have uh, more lectures, more uh, uh, relevant activities. And uh, um, uh, also, I would like to seize this opportunity to, again, uh, thank uh, CBRL for their efforts in Jordan and uh, um, uh, in the area and the region. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, uh, this uh, cooperation between CBRL and Jordan Engineer Engineers Association is a good start and I believe in the future we'll have more and more good activities, lectures uh, for the, the benefit of our heritage. Okay, yeah. thank you everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, thank you. good night everybody. Bye. Yeah, Bye. Good night everybody. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Hi Liz. <laughs>